Um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And um, uh, I want to do two things. I want, first of all, to give a very short introduction to the Venice Commission before this very, um, uh, a, a very eminent audience. The Venice Commission um, does not have a very high profile uh, in Ireland or in the UK. It has more of a profile as you move east in Europe. But I would like to explain its role because it puts the opinion perhaps in context and then I'd like to do um, a short introduction to the opinions that came from the Venice Commission in relation to Poland and put that uh, slightly in the context of um, other rule of law issues happening in Europe at the same time. Um, so the Venice Commission, uh, formerly called the European Commission for Democracy to True Law, was established in 1990 and it's part of the wave of new institutions which were established after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, um, the uh, uh, further introduction of democracy in Eastern Europe. So it's of the same lineage perhaps as the, as the OSCE and, and um, uh, bodies of that period. And the Venice Commission is, um, is an independent body associated with the Council of Europe. The funding and the Secretariat and so on are organised through the Council of Europe, but it is not, it's not a, a, an integral agency of the Council of Europe. It is, um, it is independent of it. And it has um, 61 or possibly 62 members. Uh, all the Council of Europe members, uh, many countries in North Africa, South and Central America, um, slightly unexpected countries like um, South Korea and um, Israel, Palestine and so on are there as well. The recent country, most recent country to join was Canada, which was a great, um, a great addition. And the role of the Venice Commission is to provide legal opinions and separately have to provide um, uh, legal research and reports at the request of member states. So um, its, its original aim was to, was to answer queries raised by governments. Uh, it also um, provides legal opinions at the request of um, some international bodies, predominantly Council of Europe bodies, such as the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and associated bodies such as the Congress of Local and Regional Self-Government. Um, also, on occasion, it provides legal, ad legal opinions at the request of the Euro European Commission. That is rare and it depends on the particular relationship that's happening with the country involved. That happens, I think, sort of with the consent of the government usually when that happens. Um, and um, it, uh, the Venice Commission, uh, most of the work happens through Strasbourg, where the headquarters is. It is called the Venice Commission because its plenary meetings happen in, in Venice, and it should be meeting next week, but is not for reasons that are very topical that I don't need to go into. And um, it, um, the, just to give a sort of a, 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 a photograph of its work, in 2018, which is the last year that I have um, figures for, it, it produced 35 separate opinions, um, including um, six amicus curiae briefs, predominantly for constitutional courts in various countries. It also occasionally provides amicus curiae briefs for the um, the, the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. There have been, I think, five or six examples of that in recent years. And um, it, uh, it operates it operates as the, the um, Fanola and, and you will remember the, the president of the Venice Commission is a very learned man called Gianni Bacchizio and he describes the Venice Commission as being a, a constitutional fire brigade uh, because it can act, um, it can act uh, remarkably quickly to produce, Venice, Venice, to, to produce legal opinions at short notice. So in, in this particular case, the, the opinion in relation to, um, to Poland, the request from the, the chairman of the Opera House in, in Poland was just at the end of December, the beginning of January, and the opinion was published on, I think, the 16th of January. So there was a lot of intensive work during that period. Um, so the, the areas of work that the Venice Commission works in is constitutional law, separation of powers, constitutional justice, which is subtly different from constitutional law, um, 
democratic institutions and electoral law, and it has very various um, allied bodies to deal with elections, and it has various subcommissions dealing with particular areas of work. So um, that is general background to the work, and then the involvement in 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 the um, the reforms in Poland. Um, there was the earliest involvement of the Venice Commission in the, the, in the cycle of reform was the earlier phases of reform involving the Constitutional Tribunal. There were changes introduced by the, the current Polish government which um, undermined the credibility of the, the Constitutional Tribunal and there was a lot of uh, dispute about that which was 2014-15 perhaps. And I think the result of that was to, to sort of to undermine the, the role of the constitu Constitutional Tribunal within the Constitution structure of, um, of Poland as the, the arbitrator of major um, constitutional and possibly rule of law disputes. So um, the role of the Venice Commission, as I said, is to focus on a particular uh, a particular request. There is a request, a request focused on uh, a constitutional reform or a particular draft law. So after the the earlier opinions about the constitutional tribunal, the Venice Commission had no direct involvement for some years because the matter was moved uh, moved to a different um, to a different forum. Uh, it came back to the Venice Commission again in 2017 because there were amendments at stage to the the law on the. Um, on the Council of Judiciary and also the law on the Supreme Court. And they were extremely difficult and controversial laws. And the opinion from the Venice Commission that I was involved in at that time um, uh, took the view and advised that the, 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 the scheme of amendments were um, not consistent with rule of law for three separate reasons. Um, the first reason was that the, the scheme, that the, the new scheme for the uh, Council of the Judiciary had the effect of politicising the Polish system for appointing judges. Uh, the second one was that the amendments gave the Minister for Justice, who in Poland is also the Chief Prosecutor, the amendments gave the, the Minister uh, too much power in relation to the judiciary and in particular in relation to court presidents who are a very important part of the, 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 um, the design of the, the, the judicial system in Poland. And thirdly, the, 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 there was a negative view taken in relation to the, the design of two new chambers within the, the Supreme Court. The um, amendments created two new chambers, the disciplinary ch chamber and the extraordinary remedies, I think, chamber. And these chambers were um, given uh, significantly extra powers than the other chambers and it effectively they created sort of super chambers within the existing um, within the existing Supreme Court undermining the role of the or undermining the, the constitutional design of the Supreme Court itself. Now um, the difficulties expressed with those with with the amendments from 2017 I think were proved to be to be validly placed subsequently because after those amendments took effect the authorities in Poland particularly the Minister for Justice um, uh, dismissed a large number of court presidents I think over a hundred court presidents were were um, were disciplined or dismissed and that um, uh, I think it established the fact that the the drift was that the executive had further control over the um, over the running of the judicial system. Um, uh, after that change took place, the, the 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 focus of the international involvement in the in the reforms in Poland shifted from the Council of Europe bodies such as the Venice Commission and went uh, d distinctly to, to Brussels and Luxembourg and there were various streams of um, litigation in Luxembourg that you'll be aware of. The first one I think started with the Selmar case from Ireland which um, focused on the fact that the, um, that the uh, relationship between courts across Europe was now within across the European Union was based on um, 
the concept of mutual recognition, at least in relation to criminal matters. So the, um, uh, that was the first stream of, of, of litigation to go to Luxembourg. Secondly, there were infringement actions brought by the Commission against Luxembourg because of the 2017 changes. And thirdly, there were, um, there were further preliminary references from the courts of Poland to Luxembourg in litigation commenced by, uh, by individual judges within Poland. And that last um, stream of, of jurisprudence culminated in decisions from last November that the, the, one of the two new chambers set up after the 2017 cha 17 changes was um, not to be considered to be an independent tribunal for the purpose of providing effective remedies for the purpose of EU law. And um, this, uh, uh, th that issue, as I said, went to Luxembourg. It then quite legitimately went back from Luxembourg to the courts in Poland. And when it went back to Poland, the courts in Poland decided that, that they applied the criteria given to them by, by um, Luxembourg and decided that, yes, the disciplinary chamber was not an independent tribunal. This created, I think, a sort of a, 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 a real crisis uh, in judicial, um, uh, judicial legitimacy within Poland because you have the possibility for, um, for some courts not recognizing the independence of other courts and a clash of legitimacy between these two streams of courts, which understandably could not be allowed to continue. So it did require a statutory intervention by the authorities. The statutory intervention um, uh, took the form not uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bill or a draft law from the, the ministry, but rather in, I understand, a private member's bill, which came from some, some government MPs and was introduced to the lower house in December under what is effectively an accelerated procedure because bills that do not come from the ministry are treated differently from, from, um, uh, from uh, government bills. So um, that bill, uh, was passed um, by the um, by the lower house in December, and it then went to the upper house. And the request to the Venice Commission came from the um, from the upper house, as I said, just uh, at the um, at the end of the year. So the Venice Commission issued an urgent opinion on the 16th of January, and the uh, that opinion very briefly. Um, came to the view that the proposed amendments which were before the Senate were contrary to the rule of law for six separate reasons. The first reason given is essentially a sort of a process reason because the, the way the bill was presented through private members meant that the, the expected um, opportunities for consultation and discussion and debate did not take place. Um, secondly, the amendments in the bill contained a disproportionate limitation on the freedom of speech of judges. Now, I think it's, it's understood in all our systems that judges are constrained in their involvement in, in political matters and making statements, um, and that is based on either legal provisions or convention or the, 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 the way that is done may vary, but I think it's now recognised across our different systems that judges have an entitlement to comment on matters which are relevant to their areas of work. So judges have a right to engage in discussion about judicial reform, perhaps not the budget, but, or, sorry, but perhaps not other matters of political discourse, but, um, but uh, ones which are directly judicial. So the um, uh, third reason given was that the um, the ban on evaluating whether another court is independent or not um, uh, is in conflict with EU law and because EU law is part of the rule of law applicable in Poland, then it is um, uh, contrary to the, the legal system and the constitutional system that, the, um, that, that Parliament, Parliament had, to, um, had to comply with and um, also was in conflict with ECHR norms on access to justice. Uh, this is a, is, a, was a, is a complex issue because it is not unreasonable to imagine 
provisions whereby a decision on the independence of another court might be dealt with in a, in a particular way. Um, the idea that every court of every jurisdiction and level within a legal system would be able to challenge the, 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 the foundation of a different court is, is rather broad. Um, so it is possible to, to imagine restrictions on how that assessment happens, but the, the EU angle, I think, made it difficult to apply such restrictions in this case because the effective remedy was a requirement of EU law. Um, uh, another uh, element of the law which was um, uh, inconsistent with the rule of law was new disciplinary sa sanctions were introduced and those disciplinary sanctions were written in a very broad and over general way and were difficult for judges to understand what they were expected to comply with. Um, Next, there was a stronger power given to the minister, particularly in relation to court presidents, uh, even stronger than the powers that already existed. And um, finally, a, a, a more sort of um, a, a more distant issue. There was a question in relation to the election of the first president of the Supreme Court, and the the electorate was redesigned in a way which meant that if matters fell out in a particular way, the electorate for that. Um, uh, for the for the for for electing that judge would be designed in a way which was more um, which was less representative of the judicial body. So um, that was where matters stood in the middle of January, and I understand the law did come into effect. And um, I look forward to hearing from the ombudsman about how matters have uh, developed there since then. Thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have written the, the, the whole speech, by, but my speech is so detailed that I figure out that uh, if I go into details, we would be lost, basically, with uh, uh, everything what I was going to, to say. Uh, so, so let me try to use my time in order to explain you uh, some of the most important uh, aspects of the things you uh, observe in, uh, in Poland. Uh, I would like to say Free thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the uh, International Institute for International and European Affairs for this great invitation. Second, I would like to thank Mr. Ambassador, uh, who is here with us, the previous ambassador of Ireland uh, to Poland, for his support. Uh, also to my institution, thank you very much for, uh, for this. And I would like also to thank uh, judges, Irish judges, who were represented in Warsaw by Judge McManaman uh, during the March of 1000 Gones, but as I understand, you are representing the whole uh, judiciary of, uh, of Ireland and giving uh, this personal support to, uh, to, our, uh, to our cause. It is really important because I think it is one of those uh, moments when we have a feeling that uh, it is not only our case, it is the case for whole Europe uh, and for the whole European Union. Uh, as you know well, uh, we have this ongoing rule of law crisis, which started in 2015 with the basically political subordination of the uh, Constitutional Court. So uh, as a result of different legislative uh, and practical uh, changes, uh, the Constitutional Court still operates, but it became a little bit like the facade institution, which is more legitimizing some legislative acts adopted by the ruling majority than just making like a proper uh, judicial review of uh, uh, legislation. And all those changes concerning rule of law affected not only constitutional court, but also prosecutor's office, uh, public media, uh, civil service, uh, secret services. Uh, and judiciary basically was, uh, is in fact the last guardian uh, defending uh, rights and freedoms in, uh, in Poland. Uh, and this attack on judiciary happened uh, in a moment when it was already uh, uh, obvious to everybody that we do not have any independent judicial review any longer. So if the parliament adopts any legislation, you will not be able to verify this legislation by virtue of a, uh, of a, a motion to the constitutional uh, court. And... Uh, this attack on the judicial independence was quite, let's say, complex, uh, and uh, you can divide it into different, uh, different stages. And it's not time to, to explain it uh, in detail, uh, but I would like just to give you some general ideas uh, about this. Uh, 
I think that the, the major uh, issue is what were the reasons presented for the uh, for uh, these uh, changes concerning judiciary. So basically, the major reason that has been presented by the government was, first of all, the need to make a reform of judiciary. Uh, and in fact, if you look into how police judiciary works, it's quite ineffective, especially in big cities. So the general public understood this argument. Yes, everybody would agree. Yes, we have to uh, reform judiciary. Second, there was a uh, second argument that has been presented is the need to bring more accountability of judges towards sovereign, towards uh, voters. Uh, and in order to do this, we need to bring more uh, discipline measures to the, uh, to the judiciary. But in fact, what were the real reasons behind those changes were not, like, were not those that were presented publicly, because those real reasons, and I think right now, after a couple of years, it is not even you know, difficult to, uh, to identify those reasons, were in fact something like a political subordination of judiciary, and to make a judiciary very similar to the one as operates in, uh, in Hungary. So the judiciary, which is uh, not treated as a separate third power, uh, third branch of power, but as a judiciary which has a kind of a subordinated role to the political uh, actors. And the third point I think which is important to mention is how this change happened. It happened via a set of different legislative measures that were on surface uh, quite, uh, that looked uh, as being complied, uh, as being in compliance with, uh, with some standards, but if you look deeply, you could see uh, some kind of a manipulation if though in those uh, arguments. Uh, so I will just give you one. Uh, for example, when uh, the reform of the National Council of Judiciary has been implemented, the major argument that has been presented was we have to make a system as it is in Spain, because in Spain it is the parliament which selects the members of the National Council of Judiciary, so we have, must have the same system as in Spain because it brings more legitimacy to real people. And the problem is that our constitution is different than Spanish constitution and that you cannot basically make that kind of a copy-paste. So uh, making those changes via step-by-step -step legislative measures and by using or by abusing comparative argument and by diluting arguments of opponents was more or less like the alchemy that was behind uh, changes that have been uh, implemented. And of course, uh, there was a U U European Union reaction to this. Uh, in the early years uh, of those changes, European Union started, uh, European Commission started rule of law procedure under Article 7. But at certain point, this procedure went nowhere because of the opposition of uh, Hungary. Second, uh, there, were, uh, there was a reaction started by your uh, judge Donnelly uh, in the Selmer case, so that to what extent Poland may, stay, uh, may still be part of the European arrest warrant procedure uh, in a situation when judiciary is uh, subordinated to executive power. Uh, and we know, we know well Selmer judgment uh, issued by the Court of Justice that uh, it basically didn't, uh, uh, it didn't prevent uh, Poland from continuation of, uh, of judicial reforms. Uh, the third uh, reaction were infringement actions started by the Commission, and the fourth uh, were preliminary questions asked by Polish courts, uh, to which the Court of Justice had to answer. It creates a complex bunch of legal proceedings pending at the, uh, at the Luxembourg Court, uh, and some of them have, pre uh, uh, have resulted in uh, important, uh, important judgments. But the most important judgment out of those ones, uh, the most recent one, was the judgment of 19 uh, November uh, 2019, which uh, created a ground for, uh, let's say, evaluation how the National Council of Judiciary and how disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court uh, operates. That's not mine. <laughs> uh, uh, and this judgment in a proper EU country should be just implemented. So the state should sit down, uh, the government should sit down and consider how this judgment should be implemented, how we should make a legislative reform of the National Council of Judiciary and those speci special bodies of the, uh, of the Supreme Court, special chambers of the Supreme Court. But interestingly, government didn't do it at all. Quite otherwise, the government has proposed the Muzzle Law, which was going to 
uh, let's say, keep the status quo and also to, let's say, uh, create some guarantees for the election of the new president of the Supreme Court. One of the ideas also behind the Muslim law was to silence any judges that are protesting. So right now, under this Muslim law, as, uh, as Sir Barrett uh, presented, uh, we have a number of provisions uh, under which judges who are voicing out their concern but also who are using the union law, uh, acting in their independent capacity, they could be targeted, they could be subject of uh, disciplinary uh, sanctions. And what we also observe is that there, are, uh, there is a certain number of judges which is having this actual disciplinary cases. And those cases concern either their statements made publicly, or sometimes some of those sanctions concern their uh, adjudication. So, uh, so the content of decisions they are doing, uh, especially those ones which are somehow challenging the status quo of uh, existing, uh, existing judges. So as it was said, the Muslim law, despite international uh, concern, despite opinion of the Venice Commission, despite letters by the European Union, has been signed by Mr. President uh, Andrzej Duda. So we are right now in the stage when the Muzzle law is binding law, but we are also in the stage when there are other proceedings either pending or we are waiting maybe for the start of some proceedings. So let me, uh, let me uh, summarize what is, what is happening now. So right now we wait for uh, the hearing of the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, whether the interim measure should be used with respect to the operation of the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. Disciplinary chamber, which is not recognized as a uh, fully independent court, but rather as an institution which is serving the governmental uh, interests. Uh, the hearing will take place on 9th March. Second, we wait whether the commission will start another set of proceedings, another infringement action concerning this muzzle law. The Commission has noti uh, notified its intention to start these proceedings, but, it, uh, but uh, days go, uh, weeks go, and we do not, uh, we do not see this uh, action yet by the, uh, by the Commission. But what's also what happened is that one of the judges, uh, who is quite a brave one, the judge who decided to kind of individu individually apply the judgment of the Court of Justice of 19th uh, November, and who decided to seek for the verification of the status of the National Council of Judiciary, has been recently suspended as a judge by the decision of the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. And I think it is the, one of the very first, uh, if not the first case in the modern history of the European Union, when the judge is suspended for, in fact, application of the EU, uh, of the EU law. Uh, also, uh, what happened recently, uh, in fact, on Thursday, is that Norway, Norwegian court administration, has decided to suspend the cooperation with the Polish Ministry of Justice and basically decided not to give any additional funds, as of now, to the Ministry of Justice for the, let's say, bringing better efficiency of the Polish judiciary. So they said, as long as you do not have a rule of law situation, we will not uh, participate in the European Economic uh, uh, Agreement uh, cooperation in this uh, regard. Uh, also, uh, interestingly, in meantime, the government, upon the pressure by civil society and uh, in enforcement of one of the judgments, has finally published so-called lists of support to the National Council of Judiciary. And basically, those lists of support show that there was a lot of uh, pressure by the Ministry of Justice to put proper candidates to the National Council of Judiciary. And quite interestingly, there is even a proof that one of the judges who has been appointed member of the National Council of Judiciary didn't have a sufficient support when he was appointed. So, in theory, it would mean that the National Council of Judiciary is working illegally uh, because the whole procedure uh, was made in a, uh, in a way contrary to law because one of the candidates has been elected without proper support. But the problem is that there is nobody to, to, to find it. There, is one, uh, there are institutions that may find it, which are courts, but if courts start to challenge the National Council of Judiciary, then they have disciplinary uh, cases uh, on their back. The most recent information is the start of the criminal action 
concerning one of the most important judges in Poland, Judge Tuleya, uh, who is the uh, member, uh, who is uh, one of those symbolic judges protesting against those reforms. But interestingly, the case, the criminal case, of, which started with the request to lift his immunity, and the decision on lifting the immunity is going to be made by the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. Uh, this case has started in the, uh, in the context of one of the decisions he has made a couple of years ago, uh, a decision which is uh, highly, which, which concerned the, the basic, let's say, interests of the, uh, of the ruling party. We also wait uh, now, right now for the date of 30th uh, April this year, which is the end of the term of the first president of the Supreme Court. And sometimes if you listen to politicians, they don't even, uh, they don't even hide that their intention is to basically make this process of selection of the new president of the Supreme Court in a way as to guarantee that the new first president, new chief justice, is a person who is more or less uh, kind of loyal to the ruling uh, party. Although these are not politicians who are making the selection. These are the judges from the Supreme Court who are selecting five candidates, and it is up to the president to select the president out of those five uh, candidates. But it seems to me that there is like a whole, whole pressure that among those five candidates, there is one who could be kind of electable by, the, uh, by Mr. President. I think it is important as of now to, to give like a very strong message what we could do. What, uh, how we can think about this whole situation. In my opinion, the, the first point is to understand that we are having like the uh, growing legal schism in Poland. You have uh, judges who are behaving in accordance with the constitution, uh, but you are also judges who are, let's say, accepting all those new changes, and uh, it already transfers into different uh, methods of adjudication of, uh, of cases. So it is sometimes quite important issue, you know, whether a certain judge should be excluded or not, whether this judge has been appointed by the previous National Council of Judiciary or the new Council of Judiciary. How do you interpret the consequence of the EU law uh, in this regard? These are basically questions which are asked by every judge and every lawyer in a country right now. And, and there is no clear solution as long as we'll not go this or the other way. This, I mean, democratic way or the other way, which could be interpreted as rather uh, being far away from democratic uh, standards. Second, uh, I think it should be important that this rule of law issue in Poland should be central to the European Union discourse. It is not just Polish problem. It is not the situation that you may say, oh, Poland is far away, we can ignore Poland, we can ignore Hungary because it would mean destruction of the EU legal system, because it would mean that you will not be able to cooperate within the mutual uh, recognition system, you will not have a mutual trust to judicial systems. In uh, adjudication uh, of cases, you will have to consider whether you can recognize judgment, whether you can uh, uh, enjoy uh, benefits of the European arrest warrant uh, system, what to do with different kind of family cases, with transborder investments, a lot of different problems that are based on the mutual recognition. If you have one element of the system which is sick, you cannot rely because the trust is broken. So I think that it should be central to the European Union to understand that uh, it is only the European Union which may help to, uh, uh, to, to stop this um, uh, situation to happen. Uh, I, and I think what is also missing is the, uh, as a strategy is the cooperation with other institutions. Sometimes I have a feeling that there is a different discourse at the EU level at uh, in different international institutions. Like, for example, Greco, uh, which is, the, corruption, uh, which is the, the body evaluating rule of law and corruption issues, has recently sent a letter to the Ministry of Justice. There will be a hearing of Greco uh, on Poland uh, in the middle of March, but it doesn't seem to me that there is like a lot of cooperation and synergy between different international uh, institutions. And the third point, uh, I think it is still important to show solidarity to Polish judges. It is not only the march of 1,000 guns, it is like the continuous interest in what is going on because they are risking a lot. They are risking expulsion from the profession, they are risking uh, criminal charges, uh, and, uh, and it seems to me that despite those legislative measures that are really harmful to them, they are really trying as much uh, as they can to 
to resist because they, they understand that it is not about them, it is about future of Poland and future of Polish democracy. So I would like to encourage you to show even more solidarity to Polish judges. Thank you very much. Thank you.